Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now the RX 6500 XT here isn't a graphics card that particularly excites me but it's one that fascinates me. I can't speak for anywhere else in the world but here it's actually in stock and it seems to have escaped the scalpers. I'd like to thank eBuyer Gaming for sending over this Sapphire RX 6500 XT Pulse Edition. If you buy PC parts online, like well pretty much everyone, then you've almost certainly heard of eBuyer and I've been using them since I first figured out how to put a PC together. I would most definitely recommend checking them out and who knows, you might just be tempted by a shiny new AMD graphics card. I'll leave a link down below as well as a link to the card I'm testing today. Thanks again to the wonderful people at eBuyer and with that said, let's get back to the card. I've wanted to check this out for a while and right now I'm holding out my thumb like an ancient Roman in a gladiator's arena. Will it go up or down? Shall I spare it or feed it to the lions? There are whispers in the crowd of how this thing has breathed new life into old gaming PCs while others don't speak too fondly. Reading and watching other reviews always sets you up with a predetermined expectation and as a reviewer it's sort of my job to not be immediately influenced by the mass consensus unless I come to the same conclusion on my own accord. That said, I'm sure we can all agree that there are obvious flaws with this card. 4GB of VRAM wasn't the best decision for a new GPU and the PCIe X4 bandwidth means that it will potentially suffer with PCIe 3.0 systems. You can't use Relive for capturing gameplay either due to the lack of hardware encoding. But on to the gameplay tests, I've paired the card with two test systems today. The first one is an i3-12300 PC with 16 gigs of 3200 MHz RAM. This supports PCI Express 4.0. The second is my good old i5-10400F system which supports PCI Express 3.0. I thought about testing the i3 in both modes by altering the setting in the BIOS but that doesn't really make too much sense to me. If your system supports PCI Express 4, you wouldn't purposely limit it, so instead I've gone for an alternative real-world solution. I'm going to run some footage from a few games with both systems now and talk about whether or not they were enjoyable to play with the 6500 XT. Hopefully this will help you decide if a card like this is right for you. The Witcher 3 ran very nicely with our i3 system, at the ultra settings and medium post processing, but then again I expected this because it's an older game and most modern cards, even those with 4 gigs of VRAM, should handle it just fine. That said, lowering the post processing settings like I've done will help to avoid stutter in and around busy areas like Novigrad here. Over on the i5 system which uses PCIe 3.0 the results were very similar, the average 1% and 0.1% figures were all slightly lower this time around, but the card is still doing a decent job. I'd be quite disappointed if it wasn't to be honest because The Witcher 3, while it still looks great at these settings, it certainly isn't very difficult to run these days with even entry level hardware. Far Cry 6 threw up a low VRAM warning on any settings apart from low, but the game still ran fine at medium with 76 FPS. Again, the percentile numbers were okay, though don't even think about enabling high res textures. Medium settings seems to be the sweet spot here, and Far Cry 6 still looks good. I've had the 6500 XT on my test bench or test benches whenever I've had the chance over the last week outside of testing other graphics cards of course. So I've had a lot of time to play around with it. Far Cry 6 is enjoyable under these conditions. Switching back to the i5 setup and the average was around 10 FPS less, that goes for the percentile figures as well. This wasn't intended to be a direct comparison between the two CPUs. We've already covered that. This is just an example of two separate scenarios whereby one setup is offering something the 6500 XT likes more than the other thing. It's still playable, but it doesn't feel as consistent, especially as the action heats up. Cyberpunk 2077 runs at its best with FSR enabled with this card. Thanks to the new 1.5 update for the game, we can utilize a few presets, but I went for ultra quality mode. Without FSR, the game doesn't feel that great, to be honest. There are some serious slowdowns here. 
uh, which could perhaps be eliminated with lower quality graphics. I've played a few hours of this over the past week with this graphics card and it feels okay for the most part. That said, it doesn't fare so well with the 10400F setup. Even when utilising FSL once again, the percentile figures do drop much closer to 30, with the 0.1% low falling beneath that. So far, I'd say that this GPU is far easier to consider if you have a newer PCIe 4.0 supported machine. The differences will vary on a game by game basis, but it's a far more comfortable experience when in pairing with a newer CPU and motherboard combo. Forza Horizon 5 runs with a decent average and a decent 1% low with the i3. We do get a VRAM warning once again with this preset, but I found the occasional stutters as represented by the 0.1% low figure occur at lower graphical settings as well. An extra 2 gigs of VRAM wouldn't go amiss with this card. Maybe there'll be a 6 or 8 gig version down the line, but who knows, that would certainly help. The stutters don't seem to be constant, though every so often there'll be sort of a micro freeze that doesn't necessarily impact gameplay, unless it happens to occur when you're trying to execute a perfect drift around a tight bend. I do think I was perhaps being a little bit ambitious with these settings, and enabling a 60 FPS cap makes things feel a bit better. Moving on to the i5 machine, and it's safe to say that the high settings were a definite mistake. The experience was quite jarring, in fact. I'd suggest medium or low with an FPS cap enabled, but I couldn't resist trying high considering how well optimised this title is. In GTA 5, uh, this is another older game, but at this point it's bordering on classic status. It'll run with over 100 FPS at the very high settings with MSAA disabled. This is with our i3 PCI Express 4.0 machine. It's a respectable result from the 6500, which also offered up decent percentile lows as well. You shouldn't see the game drop below 60 even with these settings, though there may be certain stress points around the map that do incur hefty drops. The same can be said for the i5 machine, very high settings yet again with a plus 100 FPS average. The 1.1% lows were also pretty solid, so if you're looking for a card capable of playing GTA with ease, look no further. I can't wait to see what sort of updates we get with this in the future, especially with this game coming to next-gen consoles. Now I've been having a lot of fun with Halo Infinite lately, and that fun has continued with the entry-level Radeon card. Now my suggestion here involves enabling the minimum FPS option and changing it to say 60. This means that the game will target a minimum of 60 FPS using dynamic scaling, and it seems to be done really well. It looks like 1920 by 1080 to me, but the performance is much better than it is when turning this option off. I can't complain about this experience at all, other than a random frame dip that occurred about three to four times over the course of my big team battle. Halo also runs well on the PCIe 3.0 system, averaging about the same as we did before with the same settings and the same minimum FPS option set to 60. The 0.1% low was actually a tiny bit better this time around. So for the last part of the video, I enabled ray tracing. Uh, this isn't a good idea with this sort of card, but I just wanted to see what we could expect. Now I did this with the i3 system in Cyberpunk 2077 to see what would happen. And to my surprise, with ray tracing set to full, we got at least 30 FPS. The one caveat here is that uh, I needed to utilize the ultra performance FSR mode. I just know there's a beautiful game under here somewhere. I'd like to explore low res ray tracing a bit more actually, so maybe we'll do that in the future. It is kind of pointless, but it's pretty cool to see that you can enable ray tracing on this card, even if you have to make the game look a bit of a pixelated mess. But FSR is there now, and it's worth playing around with the various options to see what works for you. Alternatively, you could just leave ray tracing off. It's kind of pointless but mesmerizing in a way at the same time. To conclude then, the 6500 XT is best suited to a system that supports PCI Express 4.0. I've been able to play a selection of my favourite games just fine with it, though it's the inclusion of FSR or dynamic res scaling in certain games that really help it out. Cyberpunk and Halo being the two included and obvious examples. I do hope to see the price drop, especially as it's in stock a lot of the time, at least here, and I hope I've helped a few of you out today. 
Thanks again to eBuy for sending me this card, which I'll certainly be testing with future releases to see how well it holds up. And of course, thanks to all of you for watching as well. But, and I'm going to regret saying this, let me know what you think of this card in the comments down below. Leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And hopefully, I'll see all of you in the next one.